As every cat owner knows, nobody owns a cat. Ellen Perry Berkeley Such is the best description of a species known as Felis catus, the only domesticated species of felines on the planet, in sharp contrast to the lions, tigers, leopards, and jaguars that share its recent lineage. They lack the same level of ferocity, aggression, and strength of their wild counterparts, but occasionally they show a toned-down version of it. However, it might be inaccurate to describe cats as domesticated, as it gives the impression that cats entered our human world on our terms. In reality, and in sharp contrast to all other domesticated animals, cats really just domesticated themselves. In sharp contrast to our best friends, the dogs, who look up to us, beg us for table scraps and obey our every command, the cat takes orders from no one. The domestic house cat, as stated before, traces its ancestry from the feline family. The word cat refers both to our furry quasi-friends along with the pumas and leopards that would really not take much of an issue tearing your face off. It's quite strange how such an aggressive family of mammals that make up the apex predators of ecosystems across Africa, Eurasia, and the Americas could also produce a species capable of playing with yarn for YouTube views. Cats are up there with sharks and crocodilians as one of nature's finest creations, if you could call them that. Creatures of incredible speed, strength, adaptability, along with retractable claws. And while their evolutionary history is not as long as those, say, sharks or crocodilians, their ability to dominate biomes from tundra to deserts, savannas to jungles, is simply incredible. However, the species that would become the most successful on the planet was among the least impressive of its family. In contrast with dogs, which were domesticated from the Grey Wolf during the Stone Age, cats would domesticate themselves during the advent of human civilization in the Middle East and North Africa, the birthplaces of complex human societies far after the Mesolithic period of the Stone Age. This obscure animal is known as the African wildcat, a species that exists in the wild to this day across most of Africa, save the harshest areas of the Sahara and jungles of the Congo. They also are found across much of the Middle East, Central Asia, and the Indian subcontinent. While not as grand as the lynx or the Siberian tiger, their range and adaptability were unmatched by other felines. So too are their physical features to some degree. While I would not bet that the domesticated cat would win a fight with, say, a lion, these small felines have remarkable agility due to their sense of balance. This is where the phrase, cats have nine lives, comes from. This stems from their sense of balance. Cats are able to walk carefree on high ledges and narrow paths that only members of the Jackass movies would dare to do. They also have excellent night vision, needed for hunting rodents and other prey animals which are mostly active during the night. Most of you have probably noticed that if you have a cat, they're not exactly nocturnal or diurnal, but rather what we call crepuscular, meaning that they do most of their activity during dawn and dusk napping sporadically during the middle of the day and middle of the night. This allows them to take advantage of hunting opportunities against prey, which tend to be less adaptive towards both night and day, and tend to stray the lines of a sort of binary between day or night. However, the cat's color vision is worse than that of humans. I suspect that this may be to the fact that cats are not really fond of eating fruit, and thereby didn't really need to develop as many color distinctions as diurnal creatures such as ourselves, which rely on eating a lot of vegetation. Well, that's just my guess. To make up for their poor daytime eyesight, they have whiskers, which help enhance their sense of touch, since they don't have hands. Their sense of hearing is fairly impressive, being able to hear ultrasound, meaning sounds with greater than 20 kilohertz. Their ability to detect sound from a broader range than humans helps them hear noises made from small prey animals. They also have a pretty good sense of smell. While not as good as dogs, it's certainly better than us humans. 
And let's keep it real, our sense of smell is really only good for detecting smoke and farts. Cats will even communicate using the smell of their piss. If you did this, you'd probably be arrested for public indecency. You might have also noticed that cats like to rub their faces on various objects. This is a way to mark their territory. If your cat rubs his face on your table, lamp, or toaster oven, that's its way of pretty much stealing your stuff. One of the most peculiar elements of the cat's olfactory systems is the effect of catnip. This comes from a type of plant that pretty much gets cats high, sort of, resulting in a sort of dazed and confused euphoria, just from contact to its smell. Granted, this doesn't affect all cats. It would kind of be like if beer or weed only affected 80% of people. The parallels between catnip and other animal stories of getting high, such as monkeys eating fermented fruit and dolphins getting high off of pufferfish, draw parallels between human recreational mind-altering substance use. However, it's unclear to what extent cats and these other animals seek them out and if it's possible that they could get addicted. Anyway, being creatures that evolved to be semi-arboreal hunters, a sense of balance atop high perches was essential for ecological success. When falling from a high area, cats will reflexively contort their bodies to land on their feet. However, this still has to be studied more to truly understand it, and it doesn't work in zero gravity. However, like nearly every other feline, with the massive exception of the lion, African wildcats and their domesticated counterparts are solitary creatures, not needing the same sort of social structure as humans, or even dogs for that matter. African wildcats, by and large, live on their own, with a few exceptions of mating and raising kittens. Once the kittens come of age, they are by and large on their own, except for mating season. This, in part, explains why cats are individualistic. All of life pretty much revolves around them, in sharp contrast to the dog, which was domesticated from the Eurasian grey wolf, a social animal whose life revolves around the pack. When dogs were domesticated, their social structure could easily fit in, with the communal social structure of early humans. However, cats, not so much. You can see this in the behavior of your pet cat. An animal that sure, tolerates you, maybe even enjoys your company, but lacks the same love and deference of a dog. Some people interpret this as cats being smarter than dogs. However, this is not true. Dogs are smarter. However, most people oftentimes think cats are smarter because they act in more dignified manners, such as not thinking that their own vomit is a snack food. This probably stems from African wildcats being hunters, while grey wolves, while also being hunters, were oftentimes scavengers with far less discriminatory diets. Cats have more refined food tastes, and by and large only want to eat meat, or in the case of cat food that is dry, meat that is mixed with cornstarch. This may explain why cats sometimes will eat popcorn. Going back from popcorn to ancient Mesopotamia, the first urban human societies had switched from hunting and gathering to settling down and farming grain like wheat, barley, and chickpeas. Well, chickpeas aren't really grain, but they're still a plant-based food that people farm. Anyway, however, this large amount of grain and other food that was stored in large quantities oftentimes attracted vermin, like rats and mice, which ate the harvest and spread disease. The most notable pest for early farmers and city dwellers was the mouse, which we are all familiar with. I know that I said that cats were the only species which domesticated themselves, however I suppose you could also include mice into that category since they adapted themselves remarkably well into human habitats, albeit largely without our approval. The rise of mice and rats as pests around human farms and villages eventually attracted African wildcats who would hunt them. Early human farmers would recognize this and let cats into their property. Where human civilization spread, cats would spread too, not only hunting pests, but also devastating the populations of non-pests like various species of birds, reptiles, and others, an issue that still exists to this day, particularly in geographic isolated areas like Australia, which never had native cats. Going back to the Neolithic era, long before cats stepped foot in Australia, the cat had spread from the early human civilizations of the Fertile Crescent to another area with an ancient complex history, nearly as old, Egypt. In ancient Egypt, the utility and beauty of cats 
inspired a supernatural reverence, as numerous Egyptian goddesses took the form of a cat, or at the very least had the head of a cat. It's quite interesting that the ancient Egyptians used the image of a cat for their goddesses in particular rather than their gods, and to this day, cats, male or female, tend to represent femininity. Many people, to this day, tend to see dogs as males by default and cats as females by default, in large part due to both animal and gender stereotypes. The pharaohs would eventually go as far as to mummify their fur balls so they could spend time with them in the afterlife. Cats would eventually spread further along trade routes, and, of their own volition, to Europe and the Indian subcontinent, Central Asia, and East Asia. Another major factor for the cats was less so its agility, or its stealth, or its intelligence, or rather its cuteness. Roughly being the same size as a human infant and having a head to body proportion similar to that of a baby, alongside a set of larger than normal eyes in proportion to its head, cats were considered cute and still are to this day. Whether it's human babies, kittens, or fictional characters like Hello Kitty, if you have a disproportionately big head with disproportionately big eyes, disproportionately big pupils, then humans will think you're cute and will want to nurture you. These proportions induce oxytocin, which makes us long for affection, and was probably a way for adult humans to get attached to their own offspring. Kittens have hijacked this to get humans, and most importantly the internet, to care about them. Compared to most domesticated animals, the behavior and physical differences between the African wildcat and the domesticated cat are rather small. A gray wolf and a poodle are technically the same species, but vastly different. A domesticated pig is far friendlier than that of a wild boar, and looks a lot hairier and less fat. Cats, however, are far more similar to their wild counterparts, and even the differences between breeds is far smaller than what you'd see with dogs. Compare the Great Dane to the Chihuahua. There are no two cat breeds so vastly different. This makes sense, since cats were domesticated far later in history than dogs, and did so on their own terms. The standardization of dog breeds dates back to the Victorian era, however the standardization of cats is still really a work in progress. Despite over 50 distinct breeds of cats, the domestication categorization of breeds has not been as strict. Nonetheless, in more recent decades, there have been designer cat breeds catering to cat people with thick wallets, breeds like the Aussie cat and the Toyger. Part of the reason for this lack of standardization, or at the very least, less rigorous standardization, aside from not living with us as long, is due to the large population of feral or stray cats. While not as common today in the developed world due to spaying and neutering, stray cats are commonly found in urban areas in developing countries, as cats can function fairly well on their own, in sharp contrast to, say, dogs or horses. With the exception of pigs and arguably goats, no other domesticated animal does as well surviving on its own. It's quite shocking how an animal, which is so concerned with its own hygiene as the cat, frequently licking its own body using a roughly textured tongue, could manage to adapt to the alleyways of human cities, only suitable as homes for crackheads. One case study is Lebanon, where a handful of cats were abandoned before the 1975 to 1990 Civil War, as many people had fled the country. These cats survived not only in the urban environment without an owner, but under heavy urban warfare. Their agility made the urban landscape an excellent habitat, despite the bombardment, and they were naturally talented at parkour. Today, the capital of Beirut, is one of the feral cat capitals, if you could call it, of the world, and pests are not particularly common as a result. And while cats are known for their refined taste and pickiness when it comes to food, they can abandon this in tough times, digging through dumpsters for what animal fat and protein can be found. Despite the success of feral cats, indoor cats still live far longer than their outdoor counterparts, as the former are protected from the elements. 
As much as it may suck for a cat to be indoors on face value, it's worth keeping in mind that both our pet outdoor cats and feral cats do a tremendous amount of ecological damage, killing countless small mammals, birds, reptiles, amphibians, and other small critters, which are not pests. This has especially been an issue in geographically isolated parts of the world with a lot of endemic species like Australia and New Zealand, and to a lesser extent the Americas. In many parts of the world, Cats are not natural predators, so the wildlife in those areas does not develop behaviors and mechanisms in order to avoid predation. In Australia, the government has even promoted euthanizing certain cats, which while angering cat owners who feel a deep sense of connection to their fur balls, should note that the prevalence of feral cats has led to the extinction of over 20 species on the continent. Cats, aside from their cuteness, have also not helped their cause, given the fact that they oftentimes hunt for sport rather than food. Cats have even changed their behavior in response to humans. While the African wild cats are fairly silent as adults, only meowing as their kittens, seeking attention from their mother, domesticated cats are far more vocal, and they do this in order to get human attention. Humans, after all, are not all factory creatures, as we have a poor sense of smell, but we are auditory creatures, and our hearing is pretty good, and cats will oftentimes try to communicate us via meowing, and sometimes purring. The smartest cat species, like the Siamese cats, meow the most. Today, cats still perform their primary function of killing vermin. However, they are by and large mostly kept for companionship despite them only being mildly amused by our, well, companionship. In contrast to dogs, we are more likely to love being with them than they really love being with us. Us humans are so fascinated by their every move, yet they seem so indifferent to us. I guess you could call them fluffy narcissists by nature. If you think about it, human babies are also narcissists, yet we take care of them every time they cry, and their resemblance to human babies is probably why we continue to keep them around long after the mousetrap was invented, and will probably continue to keep them around us. Like that one acquaintance that likes us, but doesn't really love us. Anyway, thanks for watching.